Hello, I'm Howard Lake from UK Fundraising. Welcome to another conversation with some fascinating people doing amazing work in fundraising and philanthropy. Um, today, I'm really, really delighted to be speaking to Professor Jen Chang, who is the co-founder and co-director of the Institute of Sustainable Philanthropy. If you've not come across Jen, you need to find out more about what she's doing. She is the world's first PhD in philanthropy and is also the world's only philanthropic psychologist. So lots to talk about there. Um, her research interests are vast and her output is vast. So you've probably caught her at some conferences, both online or perhaps if you're lucky in, in real life as well. Um, her research interests are include uh, or focus on philanthropic psychology, donor behavior and the philanthropic self. So welcome, Jen. How are you? Thank you. Good. Very well. Good, good, good. good. Um, we've only got a short time, so I'm going to try and see what we can tease out in just that time. We're going to talk about start off by telling people, um, perhaps who haven't come across it, what is the notion, what is the idea of philanthropic psychology? Well, philanthropy, as we all know, the Greek root is love for humanity. And uh, psychology in Greek is the psychology of the human soul. So in today's modern psychological language, I define philanthropic psychology as the science to understand how we love ourselves and how we love others. Fair enough. And that's, is that your prime research focus? That's my only research focus. <laughs> the only thing I know. Fair enough. <laughs> I suppose all fundraisers want to know what results does it generate. Tell us about some of the ways you've applied this learning or others have applied what you've discovered. Oh, I... I was absolutely thrilled um, when other people applied the research. I just got an email two days ago from Australia from um, a fundraiser who participated in one of our courses in March 2020. He managed the, the list of increase he sent me is like 36% ahead of, budge, of, of budget, like 5% increase in some mailing, 138% in some other mailing, 184% in, in others. It's it's just like the increase is just amazing. And, and the most amazing thing is that they get feedback from supporters. We'll just tell them how much they love them. You know, I, I, I got another I got another email summarizing how much their donors have been telling them how much they love them. And and the quote I will I'll, I'll tell you, I read read it this morning at six, where the donor just said, I have been giving for so many years to so many charities. None have spoken to me with your kindness. I was like, Wow, <laughs> you know, like, love people and they will love you back. <laughs> yeah, that's fascinating and very exciting. So does this, is, can any charity use this? Do you have to have a certain sort of size or scale or, or length of fundraising experience? No, any charity can, can use this. I mean, many people come to our like 60 minute presentations anywhere on the planet, you know, like uh, any conference, they listen to our presentation and they go up go and apply it. And I hear people telling me they come every year because every year they just come for 60 minutes and they apply it and they get results. So they keep coming back. So yeah, it, it really just, you have to, you have to open your mind up and just get this and commit to use it because the minute you use it, you begin to see that people love you back and you just don't stop using it. And it, well, what are the sort of core concepts of that core approaches that make this so, work? If, if I can say only three words to what philanthrop philanthropic psychology is about, it's about people, it's about love, and it's about well-being. So when I say using it, I meant we have to treat people as people, not just donors. So it's not to give up understanding them as donors, but primarily, primarily firstly, understand them as people and then care for them as people and then raise money as a way to make the person behind the giving feel better so that's the the people element of it and the love element of it as far as i'm concerned when you switch your focus to the person you think of ways that you can make them feel unconditional love meaning for any message you send out, whether people decide to give to you or not today, you leave them with a bit of warmth and love in their heart. Not this feeling, oh, I can't give today. I, I feel so bad. I feel so guilty. I can't. 
No, say things. Tell them how wonderful they are just picking up your mail. So leave them with anything that the person can feel better. So as a consequence, if you if you give them this kind of unconditional love to the person, then their psychological well being will be higher. And we all know happier people give more. So nobody loses when we make people happy. And kindness, well-being, love just seem to be even more appropriate for, for this year of all years. Do you think has philanthropic psychology really come into its own in, in 2020 with, with these kind of concerns, do you think? I mean, we have been giving out free information from the beginning of COVID and we have been collecting data. And to be honest, for everybody who have been loving their donors, I haven't heard anybody telling me that they are not getting the results that they need. Fabulous. And does this apply to, to mass market, to individual giving across the board, or does philanthropic psychology apply to grant making, to major donors as well? Uh, to major donors, definitely, because you, you love the person behind the giving is the same principle. Mm. Um, only difference is it is extremely difficult to collect quantitative data on major gift donors. So primarily, the science of philanthropic psychology as it stands now, the evidence base come from mass donors, but the principles behind um, the uh, evidence we get from mass donors are applicable to major gift donors, I would say. And the reason is because the same principles have been applied to understanding how to improve um, marriage lives. The same principle have been uh, applied to to understand how to improve uh, elderly's well-being after they retire. And the same principle have been applied to people to help others overcome major life challenges like cancer diagnosis or depression or trauma. So it's the same principles of growing love that can be applied across the board. And I think I know the answer to this, but this, this applies to pretty much any culture, does it? Or is it just um, sort of the traditional fundraising um, charity areas of, of Europe, North America, um, Pacific? We, um, we, we have worked with Chinese charities and that seems to apply there. Um, the, the, the core principle of people, love and psychological well-being are the same, but the way that they're expressed and experienced and need to be articulated are different. So there is a degree of customization that need to happen, but it is not because this charity is Chinese, it is because this charity is animal charity, this charity is cancer charity, this, this charity is research based. So we actually find more differences between organizations than between organizations from one culture versus organizations from another culture. And what are the sort of hallmarks of success? What does a charity, where does a charity need to be to, to actually start making the most of, of philanthropic psychology? In terms of board training, training and uh, sort of understanding amongst other other um, staff at the charity and volunteers, can it just be led by the fundraiser, or does it it has to be embedded elsewhere? The most successful way that I have seen people using philanthropic psychology is there's one really committed person. She or he just go ahead and do it. But the but the beauty of this approach is when this person is doing it other people get infected. You know, they, they, they just love what come out of them. They love reading their letters. They love listening to them. They ask them to give training to other staff. They, they ask them to comment on, on major gift event planning. They ask them to comment on direct mail. They ask fundraisers to comment on marketing communications. And I often hear people to say, I can never get my marketing director into my meetings. And somehow they just want to come to your meeting. <laughs> Yeah, so I think it's it's one person has to be really committed and just keep using it and then just wait for others to come along. That's quite inspiring because quite often I've, I've found it is one person, one fundraiser who gets an idea and then as long as they have the resilience, um, they can eventually win over the sort of the broader organisation. That's very encouraging. Um, so yeah, should, sorry. should we... Sorry. Sorry, Carl, can we just um, add one thing there? Like when one fundraiser begin to do it, usually what you find is they begin to get positive donor feedback. So once they get 
unsolicited donor thank yous back to them and that they share those across board, that's when they begin to warm the organization up. So we keep talking about donors. Is is donors the right word these days? Um, given the sort of the focus on on love and respect, should we should we just be thinking of them as people? And, and does that terminology matter, do you think? Does that affect fundraisers? I I honestly think that it's a bit un unrealistic to say you know, in the trade of fundraising, we have to give up using the word donor, supporter, volunteers, or anything. I think if we arrive at a higher level of shared understanding, where we know that what we care about is the person, then what terminology we use is not as important. Fair enough. Yeah, that makes sense to me. I would read the debates over the years of which, how to describe the organization, charity, nonprofit, for good and so on have just sort of raged on without any conclusion so that's, that's quite encouraging tell me what uh, what are you working on at the moment where's where's the institute focusing at the moment uh, the institute currently is working one uh project we call the retention project is the first time that where we put people love and well-being into a longitudinal 18 months study with organizations where we are going to allow these new set of measurements that we have tested and we have known to be effective all to be in the same place in the same survey, but different from other projects that we have done in the past, we are now allowing these survey results to drive the design of case for support. So it's not like we are just saying, oh, here's the results and go use it, because we found that it actually takes a connection between the research findings and the copywriting proof uh, um, briefs in order for it to really um, generate the impact it needs to generate. So we're filling that step now in between the research findings and the, the copywriting briefs. And then we're also now adding the um, 12 months follow up to track that if people use this approach, real money will follow. And where can people find out more about this research when it's when it's published and shared and, and your other um, publications, including your book, which was out, I think this year, The Philanthropic Psychology, Scientifically Uncovering the Person Behind Giving. Where can we find, find more? Um, our website is the best place to go. Um, we have all our reports are freely available online. Whenever we have any research reports, we will let you know. They can all be downloaded. And obviously, when the book is published, I will shout to the world. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. We'll certainly share that on, on UK fundraising as, well, fundraising as well. Professor Jen Thang, Professor Jen Shang, thank you very much indeed for your time. Absolutely. Thank you.